listeners, we're glad to have you back for another episode of the Climate Ready Podcast. This is Ingrid Timbo, and I'm joined by my colleague and co-host, Alex Maroner. In today's episodes, we look towards the coast. Specifically, we'll explore some of the most pressing topics facing coastal communities today. That of disappearing wetlands, sea level rise, severe flooding, housing equity, and insurance, and what happens when communities are forced to make tough choices between staying put, rebuilding, or relocating. On the show, we often tend to focus on adaptation issues related to freshwater, but we'd be remiss not to cover stories of climate change and adaptation from some of the world's most vulnerable areas, which in this case means the rapidly changing and even somewhat disappearing coast. We were really thrilled to land our main guest, Elizabeth Rush, an author, photographer, and professor whose latest work of creative nonfiction gives a platform to the often marginalized communities of the United States coastline and what she calls the New American Shore. Through her own research experiences and the stories that she brings from coastal residents themselves, we learn how climate change is forcing individuals, families, and whole neighborhoods to make some difficult choices about their futures, even if that future involves the abandonment of their communities. We'll go ahead and cut to the interview, which will be followed by a special segment at the end. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us your reviews and comments and follow us on Facebook using at Climate Ready Podcast. Enjoy. The Climate Ready Podcast is a product of AGWA, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, an informal network for water resources adaptation to climate change, focused on supporting experts, decision makers, and institutions within the water community to find common solutions for sustainable water resources management. The podcast is made possible by funding from the World Bank Group. For more on the World Bank and its role in supporting climate adaptation efforts, visit www.worldbank.org. For today's interview, we're really excited to bring in our guest, Elizabeth Rush, a writer, photographer, and professor whose work explores how humans adapt to changes enacted upon them by forces seemingly beyond their control, from ecological transformation to political revolution. This plays out in two of her books, Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore, and Still Lives from a Vanishing City, Essays and Photographs from Yangon, Myanmar. In addition to her books, Elizabeth has a number of other excellent publications and articles, which you can find on her website. She's the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, including the Science and Society Journalism Award from the National Association of Science Writers. Currently, she teaches creative nonfiction courses at Brown University in Rhode Island, where she works to bring environmental sciences and digital technologies into the humanities classroom. Today, we'll focus mainly on your latest work, Rising, and what it's like to write about climate change. Elizabeth, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Alex, for having me. And thanks, Ingrid. Absolutely. So I wanted to kind of just kick off the discussion talking about your latest work, which Alex mentioned, Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore. It's a really kind of, I would say, like a moving set of stories weaving together the lived experience of communities on the front line of coastal change, including climate change, living in some of the most vulnerable parts of the United States, along disappearing shorelines and in coastal wetland areas. I'm really curious where the idea for this book came from and what were you hoping to add to the national conversation on climate change and also just sea level rise more generally? So the idea in the biggest sense, like in the most general sense for rising came probably around 2011. I was sent by an international magazine called Le Monde Diplomatique to do a story on the India-Bangladesh border fence, which is the longest border fence in the world. And they wanted sort of an on-the-ground report about what it was like to live with this fence as part of your life. And so I spent about three weeks in India and different towns along the border, and then three weeks roughly in Bangladesh um, in different border towns. And one thing that I found that really surprised me in Bangladesh was in the number of towns that I went to, folks would tell me that the fence itself wasn't the biggest issue for them, that saline inundation was for them the biggest issue. And and I remember one day really specifically, I was walking, I was with a young man named Faharul. He must have been, you know, 
13, 14 years old. And we walked for about, gosh, I want to say well over an hour, at least maybe two hours to get to this tiny patch of sort of failing mustard greens that he was growing. And he said, you know, I used to be able to grow food here that we could live off of my family. You know, this is our family land. Um, But because of the salt water that's arrived, everything's starting to wilt and die. And it turned out um, someone from his family has already had already left and had snuck through that border fence uh, under the cover of night and was now living in India and trying to eke out a living there. And Baharul was thinking about leaving too. And mm-hmm. I knew then in a really profound way that this thing that I had started to hear about, you know, sea level rise, wasn't just a problem for the future, that it was starting to sort of reorganize and sort of disassemble our coastal communities now in the present. And so I came back to the U.S. and I I was also sort of reluctant to write about sea level rise in Bangladesh because if there was one place where that story was being reported, it was in Bangladesh. And I figured if it was happening there, it was happening here. And I wanted to make the story of sea level rise feel closer to home for a U.S. audience. Because I think that it was, at the time, it felt like something that you could read about, but then sort of dismiss as like, oh, you know, that poor low-lying country of Bangladesh, that's something that's happening there. So I set out to find stories in the U.S. where it was happening in the present tense. And yeah, the idea for the book in the general sense, went from there. This idea that I wanted to sort of focus on communities that were tremendously vulnerable Mm -hmm. um, and whose voices aren't always part of the climate change conversation, I think that came a little bit later in the process. I think it was last month in the New York Times that they had this article about how climate change is really no longer a thing of the future. It's here now, and that means that awareness and adaptation really need to speed up. With this large number of storms in recent memory that are only likely to get more severe and more frequent, the timing is absolutely right for this book to come out and shed some light on the subject. Absolutely. You know, when I set out to write Rising, I had a very hard time selling the book. People were like, ugh, sea level rise, yawn. (laughs) And not that it's some bestseller or anything, but you're absolutely right. People are really interested in it. I thought, even writing it, that okay, it would get published, and then in five years or 10 years, we'd have the string of storms that would wake people up to the reality that we're living with this issue now in the present tense. And really, I think that string of storms happened last year in the United States. You know, literally, statistically, in September of 2017, one in 10 U.S. citizens was living in a county with a disaster declaration. Yep. Even as someone who writes about this stuff really regularly, I thought that moment was going to be in the future and I was wrong. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having read the book, one of the great successes of it uh, is you're writing at multiple levels and you're interviewing people who are maybe more scientific or technical and then talking to people in the community on the ground Um, who are experiencing everything that's talked about at this higher, more academic or policy level. And so there's so much interest in the way that you kind of weave together these stories. And you talked about the idea of end sickness. I don't know if this is a phrase that you coined or if you had heard it before. I thought it was fantastic. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about this concept, where it came from and what it's all about and and what it means in the context of your story? Yeah, so... I don't want to claim that I came up with the word end sickness. I think I came across it in a Margaret Atwood book. And yet at the same time, I have looked for it and I haven't found it. That word comes up in a chapter on the Gulf of Maine. And I spend the morning out in the Sprague River Marsh with a bunch of Bates geology students who are measuring the rate at which pieces of the marsh that are rotting are giving off methane gases. Because this is something that we're starting to see with accelerated sea level rise. It's happening all across the Everglades. It's happening in in wetlands around around the world. Most wetlands sequester these gases and a wetland that rots then 
pushes all of those gases back into the atmosphere that it's long sequestered, which is a really terrifying idea. And is one of those feedback loops, is one of those things that as sea levels rise, wetlands start to drown, and as wetlands drown, they release greenhouse gases, accelerating the rate at which sea levels are rising. So I spend the morning with these students studying this process, and then I spend the afternoon with a woman named Laura Sewell, whose family has had land alongside this wetland for a couple hundred years, and she and I go kayaking out into the Gulf of Maine. And the Gulf of Maine is somewhere that I love and adore. I grew up going up to coastal Maine during the summer as a kid. And as a kid, I always remember that the water was so cold, you just couldn't swim. You could like jump in and jump out and that was it. And here we were in August after hearing, you know, about in a really sort of intimate way about this feedback loop that's happening in these coastal wetlands. And we paddle out like a mile to these islands and I put my hands in the water and the water is just really, really warm. And it just literally physically made me nauseous. And I think that that feeling of nausea, that feeling of literal physical illness, because you know that the world you're inhabiting is not, is not the world that you had inhabited five, 10 years ago. And you know that human beings whether we can see them sort of like pressing the levers in that present moment or not, are really responsible for it. And that many of the things you value and adore are fundamentally threatened and are disappearing. It's sort of, it's, I think it produces a real feeling of end sickness as sort of living through a kind of end of times. And it's something that I think a lot of us feel and we don't exactly know how to name. Right, right. So here we all are in various states of our own end sicknesses. And it kind of then puts you in the mind of, we can see this happening, but what do we do? And there was a passage from your kind of co-authors that you sprinkle mm-hmm. throughout the book. The essayist writes, she doesn't have any uncertainty about the climate science, but she has a lot of uncertainty about what to do. This is something even, I, you know, I work in this field, but sometimes there's a paralysis that comes potentially with that end sickness. And I'm wondering, is this something that you've also dealt with? And are there any insights that you can offer as to how we might find ways ourselves in our work and, and just in our lives to move forward, despite these great uncertainties, despite these overwhelming feelings of sickness? One of the things that I think about a lot is a community in Staten Island called Oakwood Beach. It's tremendously low-lying and tremendously vulnerable to flooding. And after Sandy, the residents there sort of got together collectively and said, we don't want to live here anymore. And this is like a working class, right-leaning, initially climate change denying, though it seems from interviews that I've done now five years out, they are on board with climate change now as a fundamental sort of human reality. These are people that I didn't think would, in the wake of this storm, start to advocate for their homes to be demolished, purchased and demolished by the state and returned to nature. They just didn't seem like the poster children for that kind of grassroots advocacy. And then here they were asking that their land be returned back to nature so that it could act as a buffer in the storms to come. So I went back as part of the book tour this summer And many of them had maintained, you know, they maintain their relationship with their communities. I asked for sort of a rough estimate of what percentage of folks who participated in the buyouts stayed on Staten Island, and they said 80%. And while that's not possible in super low-lying areas like the southern coast of Louisiana, I do find this idea that a buyout won't necessarily fracture community, something that fills me with a lot of hope. The other thing here with the story of Oakwood Beach is that everyone who participated said, I won't do it if a developer is going to come in and build luxury condos. Like, I will do it if me giving up my home place means that I'm keeping other people safe in the future. So there's a sort of desire for environmental and economic justice And then also a desire to leave a legacy to help folks in the future. And that, to me, is sort of the positive 
flip side of climate change is that I also think it's a really profound opportunity for transformation and one where we can sort of start to heal our relationship with the land, with each other. And I don't think that ought to be underestimated. I think that it is an opportunity for transformation, not just destruction. I mean, throughout the research you did for this book, you're getting some really, like you said, surprising in some cases, but really insightful and an honest feedback from these people on the ground who are living this in the day of the day. And in a lot of ways, you reach out and you work with these vulnerable and imperiled communities along the shores, and, and they're really serving as kind of co-authors for this book, and you're giving them a voice that's all too often reserved for more widely publicized stories. Like, you know, we, we hear more about Hurricane Harvey because it has an impact on Houston uh, as opposed to Maria and Puerto Rico. So I wonder what led you to focus on these smaller communities that you do throughout the book, like the Ile de Jean Charles in Louisiana or or even neighborhoods like the Tan Yard and Pensacola Beach in Florida? Two things sort of led me to that kind of focus. And one is very grounded in a kind of physical reality, which is the places that are flooding the most now are often tidal wetlands or communities situated alongside tidal wetlands or on top of former tidal wetlands. And as I started to dig into the history of these places, but also the current reality of these places, they tend to be lower income communities of color. And in a place like Pensacola, you know, Pensacola was one of the largest destinations for runaway slaves in the American South, in part because it is just basically one big swamp. It's, it was a huge tidal wetland. And the land itself has historically not been that coveted because it tends to be sometimes wet. So on the one hand, there's this very physical reality that some of our very most vulnerable communities in a sort of in physical, geographic, geologic sense are also some of the most like socially, socially and economically vulnerable as well. And the other part of it, so each chapter opens with, yeah, I like, I like that term co-author. I've never heard anyone use it, and I really like it. So each chapter opens with um, what I think of as a testimony. It is written entirely in the voice of a resident of the community that the chapter is about. And I wanted to include the actual voices in part because I felt like for me, as a journalist, as a creative nonfiction writer, working on this book, the science is troubling and important, but I felt like in some ways we're getting good at sort of being numb or immune to the different stats around climate change that we see in the newspaper. And the thing that would always really touch me was just sitting with residents and hearing their stories. And so I wanted to draw readers into that experience. I wanted them to feel like they're sitting in the living room of Nicole Montalto or sitting in the living room um, with Dan Kipnis. Because when you hear these stories straight from the people that they're impacting, I think it does something different and really adds a layer of urgency to the story. And as you mentioned, these are voices that often get left out of the official dialogue. And in my mind, that's one of the shortcomings of the climate change conversation in this country is that it often comes at us from sort of the perspective of experts. And that can easily then be turned into a political conversation. And I think when you start to talk to the people on the front lines of this phenomenon, you understand that it's not political. It, it, it impacts Republicans and Democrats alike. So um, the sooner we can wrap our minds around that, the better, I think. One of the things that these types of narratives really help in terms of like putting faces to these issues is cultivating a sense of compassion or a sense of empathy with what is happening. Giving space for people to tell their own stories, I think is really important. Do you see that as one of the things that you wanted to get out of this project? You know, it's interesting. I think, Alex, you use this word or like a phrase, you give these people a voice and it's, and I'm, I'm not trying to criticize you. It's a phrase that I use a lot. It's a phrase that I hear a lot. 
And one of the reasons why I wanted their actual voices in the book was because I, I didn't want to like give them a voice so much as give them a megaphone. Like, let me with whatever, you know, marginal or real public presence I have, I want you to use me to speak with people. I don't need to tell your story. You need to tell your story, but I can help people connect with it. Because you're right, this question of how do we write about, how do we engage with empathy? And I think in many cases, like the the desire for and the, the budding energy around environmental justice, how do you do that in a way that's not exploitative yes. um, is really, really complicated. And just quickly on that, one of the reasons I think it's really interesting and really it illuminates this idea of the transference of risk that's happened. But these stories then that you illuminate is like, well, a lot of these people don't have a choice and it's a legacy, you know, that goes beyond them of why they're placed here. And so I think this is a part of the conversation that at least in the United States, we're not really hearing a lot. Yeah, no, it's crazy. Even with Florence, you see the coverage and it's sort of, it's almost as though the media is sort of like hell bent on um, often representing people who stay as being unintelligent. I'll tell you, people don't stay in floods because they don't know the risk. They stay because they don't have a lot of options to leave. Right. And right. Oh, it's man. just amazing to me that that's sort of the tone of the public conversation. Still, it's disheartening to say the least, but hopefully the needle is moving. I, I do think the needle is moving on how we're having these conversations, even if it's slow. No, I think that's for sure. And this is kind of a tough one. This book is a collection of stories, and you've done all this research in these different locations, but kind of with the underlying theme of flooding and sea level rise. Have you been able to tease out some sort of key theme or, or key lesson you could take away from all of these to give it some sort of connective thread? I mean, I think the overwhelming thing I learned in this book is that our lives on the coast are fundamentally changing. And the sooner we can wrap our minds around that, the better. I think of something often that a man named Jeremy Lowe, who's a coastal geomorphologist in San Francisco, who's working on nature-based adaptation solutions to sea level rise for well over two decades. He's sort of the head of one of the largest wetlands restoration projects in the country in San Francisco Bay. And I asked him, you know, what do you think the longevity of this project is? You're restoring, you know, wetlands equal to the size of three Manhattans. And is this a solution? Is this a solution to sea level rise? And he said, listen, you know, all this does is buy us time. We have to move people. We have to move infrastructure. And the sooner we can wrap our minds around the fact, the better off we are, the more likely we are to do that with a sense of equity in mind. And if if wetlands restoration buys us time to be able to think about that, that question, he's like, I'm all for it. But in some cases, we're going to have to retreat. And that's a difficult conversation to have, but we have to start having it now. Well, hopefully we've been able to help raise awareness about some of these issues in our conversation today. We really appreciate your time and your perspective, Elizabeth. I know Ingrid and I both enjoyed the book, and we love learning more about this facet of climate change through its stories and the voices that you help to amplify. Thank you for the great, fabulous questions and the wonderful conversation. Absolutely. Thanks again. It's, yeah, it's been fun. It was really wonderful having Elizabeth on the show. The subtitle of her book is Voices from the New American Shore, and I think that really gets to the heart of why her reporting should be an important addition to the global conversation on climate change. A lot of the time when we hear about natural disasters or sea level rise, it's framed in terms of the climate science or or just statistics that lump everything together in terms of dollar values or total habitat loss. One of the greatest triumphs of Elizabeth's creative nonfiction reporting is that it helps to peel back the facts and elevates the voices of the people behind the statistics we so often hear thrown around. These are deeply personal, hard choices that have to be made and there are often no easy answers. 
Obviously, the climate science is extremely important, but as she said, the constant drumbeat of news can make us feel numb. I know that's certainly been true in my case, but hearing these personal stories from often marginalized voices can be far more impactful than a book full of numbers, and I will remember people like Chris Brunet and Alvin Turner for a lot longer than I will the dollar amount of damages caused by Hurricane Harvey. It's interesting, too, that since this episode was mostly about the situation in the United States, it's fair to say that climate change often gets way too politicized. But when you're actually hearing from those people facing these issues daily, you know, regardless of their political ideology, it really solidifies the argument that climate change is not a political topic, and we need to approach it with an all-hands-on-deck mentality. So I'd like to close this episode by you know, leaving on, on a bit more of a positive note. And while, you know, we know that climate change is forcing us to make some very tough choices, especially around our coastal communities, it isn't always inherently a bad thing. We can also look at this as an opportunity to transform, to leave a more environmentally and socially just legacy for future generations. Change may not come easy, but in some cases we can make the difficult choices that are ultimately better for all of us in the long term. For anyone that wants to explore these topics even more, we highly recommend Elizabeth's book, Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore. Check out the episode description and our website for links to the book and other details. Since this episode drew heavily from Elizabeth's book, we thought we'd do something a little different to wrap up. Instead of another postcard from the future, we asked Elizabeth to read a short excerpt from Rising. On Climate Ready, we often end up touching on the nuanced topic of risk. Here's Elizabeth explaining some of the complexities of risk and why the perception of risk has changed over time. And it may surprise you. So this comes from a chapter in Rising called Risk. Risk is a word with more than one definition. Miriam Webster says that risk is a situation involving, quote, the possibility of injury and peril. And also, quote, the chance that an investment such as a stock or commodity will lose value. One definition is physical and the other fiscal. Lately, I've been thinking that the difference between the two is a question of proximity. To be at risk means occupying the space of the threatened body drawn close to danger. If peril is primarily financial, however, the person assessing the risk is most likely standing at a safe remove, far from the floodlines. From a distance, risk looks like something that can be managed through informed decision-making or insurance. Where Samuel investigates natural disasters from this perspective, I'm more inclined to consider the former definition first. Over the past half a century, our collective perception of the kinds of risk posed by flooding has undergone a profound transformation. Rebecca Elliott, a professor of sociology at the London School of Economics writes that before the advent of the National Flood Insurance Program, Floods were considered, quote, unfortunate events that could be neither foreseen nor prevented. Those afflicted by floods were often blameless victims facing misfortune that might befall anyone, even those who had made the right choices. We used to think of someone who flooded as being exposed unfairly to a certain kind of unpredictable and unwieldy weather as suffering an act of God. However, when that National Flood Insurance Program began mapping flood risk zones and conducting probabilistic risk assessments, flooding became, as Elliot put it, a scientifically foreseeable patterned event. What one can foresee, one can prepare for. And so individuals were expected to account for and manage the costs of living in the floodplain by purchasing insurance. Put another way, today, if people are uninsured, they're perceived as having participated in their own undoing. That does it for this episode of the Climate Ready Podcast. A big thank you again to Elizabeth Rush for the great conversation and for closing us out with a powerful excerpt from her book. Until next time, everyone. Climate Ready Podcast is produced by John Matthews of the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. It is directed and edited by Alex Maroner and Ingrid Timbo.